we're starting off tonight with something I know you care about. Your money, with new numbers out now showing that the economy has been shrinking. But does that mean a recession's on the way? Should you be worried? Experts in the markets aren't so sure. We'll talk about what that GDP report means for you. Speaking of money, President Biden's asking Congress for a lot of it, with a huge $33 billion spending plan to help Ukraine. That's more than what some countries spend on their entire militaries, period. How it could make a difference. And the latest on those new strikes in Kyiv today coming up. Plus, breaking news from the FDA. Did you hear about this? Laying out a plan to ban menthol cigarettes. Why this decision could have a big effect on the health of black Americans. And the president's inching closer and closer to canceling student loan debt, just as more and more high schoolers are deciding to delay college or not go at all. Why gap years are up and enrollment is down in tonight's original. Plus, the first guy to shake Roger Goodell's hand at tonight's NFL draft probably won't be a quarterback for the first time in five years. So who is it going to be? We'll talk about that a little later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and today we're going to break down some big questions about the economy. Why is the country's GDP shrinking? Why is our economy getting a little bit smaller this last quarter? And why don't experts seem to be all that worried about what it means long term? Let me lay out the numbers for you. You've got the U.S. economy today shrinking by 1.4 percent. That's down from the other number you see on your screen, nearly 7 percent. That was the gain in the last three months of 2021, coming off the fastest single year rise since the Karate Kid was in theaters. So here's what it means for you. People are spending more to start the year, 3 percent more just about. But everything's costing more, too, with prices up nearly 8 percent. So in plain English, you are buying more and it is getting more expensive. President Biden's not all that worried. He's telling small business owners the U.S. is doing just fine with the White House, saying the economists they're talking with are looking at the fine print and not too concerned. Consumer spending, business investment, residential investment, all of these increased um, at strong rates in the first quarter and uh, as, as the overall demand and it are good signs for the strength of the economy. You know who else isn't concerned? Traders over on Wall Street. Take a look at this. The Dow up something like 600 points on this very news today. Let me bring in Tom Costello, who is live for us here. So, Tom, you've got Jen Psaki saying, hey, experts are trying to separate the noise from the signal. Help us separate the noise out. So I'm going to put on my CNBC hat from my years I was going to say, your many years, market. yes, yes. Uh, here's the problem. Everything she said is accurate. There are many, many, many reasons affecting what's happening right now in the stock market. Why did the stock market rally today when we look like we are shrinking, the yeah. economy shrank? Which typically because would be like a warning sign. Typically, people might go, hey, maybe a freak out is needed. It could be, but there's always so many factors. The reason the rally, the rally on Wall Street happened today is because, essentially, we've seen the market slide so much in recent days, it was poised for a bounce. We also had really good earnings today from Facebook, from Meta, and the stock rallied 18%. Now, there's also the psychology that's at play here. If, in fact, the economy shrank in the first quarter, as it did, mm -hmm. then might that mean we don't need as many interest rate hikes okay. down the road because maybe inflation will be is not going to be as bad of a maybe it's going to slow faster on its own as opposed to just the Fed uh, intervening. That said, inflation is a big yeah. problem right now, 8 percent right now. And that is why the Fed, as you alluded to, is looking at potentially yeah. getting interest rates to something like 2.75 percent by the end of this year after, during the pandemic, rates it near zero, basically. So yeah. how does this play into that? So we are expecting what, what Wall Street calls a 50 basis point hike next week. Oh, my God. Plain English, please. Half a percentage point. Thank you. Wall Street loves to say things in very complicated terms <laughs> to make themselves sound smart. We, we hate that here. 50 basis points means half a point. So now you learn something you can you know read the wall street journal understand what they're saying half a percentage point coming next week yes we're going to probably have many more interest rate hikes over the coming year unless things slow fast enough but here's the fear the fear is that as if it wasn't already bad enough that we shrank in the first quarter could higher interest rates put the economy into a recession? So that's the question. That's everybody's question. Yes. But we've got so much good news going on. I mean, Janet Psaki was right. We've got very strong consumer demand. We've got unemployment rate right now at a 40-year low, yeah. right? A 50-year low on the unemployment rate, sorry. But inflation at 40-year highs. I mean, we've got so many competing factors. We've got the war in Ukraine, the supply chain crisis getting worse because China's in a lockdown. The Omicron variant certainly did slow things down in January. January, February, March. Yeah. So it's one of those things where you can't point to one reason. There are multiple factors. And because you can't point to one reason, you can't say this is how it's going to turn out down the road. I think that for a lot of people who might be watching right now, we're really feeling it. Listen, I know I am at the grocery store yeah. and at the gas pump, right? Yeah. And specifically on gas prices. Um, 
tick up a little bit from last week, 414, still more than last year, right? It's down from where it was a little bit earlier in the year. But today you have on, on Capitol Hill congressional Democrats saying the solution is to go after these gas and oil companies. Listen to what Chuck Schumer said. Here's the bottom line. They're not even using the money for domestic energy production. They're using it for stock buybacks. They're using it to make their shares go up. But at the same time, they say a gas tax holiday is dead. So if you are one of these people who are going to pay for gas and you're getting smoked right now, what's the solution? Look, here's the problem on the whole oil and gas picture. As we've said it a million times, oil and gas, well, oil prices are set globally, not locally, right? right? So what's the global supply is affected by Russia, by so many countries not taking Russian oil. Until that is replaced in some fashion, gas prices are not going to come down anytime soon. Then, in addition, we're going into the summer driving season. Chances are we're all going to be paying 4 to 4.15 a gallon nationally as the average for several months to come. Tom Costello, good to see you breaking that down. Does it feel good to have your CNBC hat on again? I liked being at CNBC <laughs> all those years, but now I can speak plain English. That's nice, too. I love that, friend. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate right. it. We're talking about dollars and cents. And what seems to make a lot of sense to President Biden right now is asking Congress for more dollars, a huge new aid package for Ukraine. Remember we told you yesterday it was going to be massive based on our sources reporting. Turns out those sources weren't kidding. Here's the breakdown. Thirty three billion dollars. A lot of that is going to beefing up Ukraine's military. But there's also money for economic help, for humanitarian aid and for feeding Ukrainians, getting food to these people who need it. The president says not doing anything is going to cost a whole lot more. The cost of this fight uh, is not cheap, but caving to aggression is going to be more costly if we allow it to happen. He's hoping the money will help stop scenes like the one we're seeing tonight in Kyiv. This one is captured by our Aaron McLaughlin, one of our NBC News correspondents you've seen on this show. Smoke from a couple of big explosions clouding the sunset there. Or in Mariupol, where the city council is saying 100,000 people are in mortal danger, they say. Mortal danger because they just don't have clean water. They're under siege. Mike Memoli is outside the White House for us. And, Mem, let me put some context out there for folks first. If we pull up the numbers, right? The U.S. spent something like $800 billion on the military in 2021. Russia, $66 billion. The billion dollars in military aid, $20 billion that President Biden wants to show, that's more than like what Spain, for example, spends on its entire military in a, in a single budget year. This is a ton of money, and I think it's important to have that perspective. Does the White House expect Congress to approve every penny? Well, Howie, one of the many, many questions as this bill now heads up to Capitol Hill to deliberate is whether Congress will do with this funding request what it did with the last one President Biden set up to the Hill. That time, it was in late February, early March, Congress actually decided to take the original number and add to it. They plussed it up. But this is a different request if you look sort of at the breakdown within the different buckets, economic versus security assistance versus humanitarian aid. In that request, in early March, the balance of military assistance to the overall package was about 25 percent. This time, it's 60 percent. This is much more, as the administration is saying, about keeping the weapons and the ammunition flowing, the Ukrainians basically taking everything they can get as quickly as they can get it. Now, there's obviously a big question ahead. This is not just tied up into the COVID funding that the president was also pushing for today, but the immigration debate, Title 42, whether Congress can sort of attach an amendment to any of these funding bills that might stop the president from being able to move forward uh, on Title 42. Can you pull on that thread a little bit more? Because you have some Senate Democrats. I look at Patty Murray, for example, suggesting that the COVID funding, Ukraine tie-in, you know, there are, there are questions around that, if you will, more broadly. It was so interesting when the president was asked this question directly. He said, I don't care what they do. <laughs> he just wants it passed. Now, obviously, sometimes with you have to with Congress, you have to take something that is a bit of a poison pill and put it with something that everyone agrees on. And that's what we saw in the past with Ukraine funding. But as I said, the the real issue of immigration here is spoiling. We saw Alejandro Mayorkas, the DHS secretary on the Hill, getting grilled again today about the administration's plan moving forward. It's really uncertain at this point where they're going to end up here. Mike Memoli outside the White House for us. Mike, thank you. Moderna today, big news, big news on the pandemic front if you are a parent of a little kid, because Moderna has now become the first company to ask the FDA to authorize its vaccine for millions of kids under the age of six, the littlest kids. This is news that some parents have been waiting for for months. Those shots could be available by the summer. Here's the deal. Kids under six under Moderna's plan would get two low dose shots four weeks apart. 
the dose itself, it's like a quarter of what an adult would get. Pfizer, by the way, is also working on a vaccine for younger kids. TBD on that. The CDC says as of February, about 75 percent of kids and teens in the U.S. have had COVID at least once. So that's the context here. Dr. John Torres is joining us now. It is hard to overstate. Listen, I am speaking and I got to be candid with you and our audience here as a parent of a young child and as somebody who talks to a lot of parents of young kids exactly. um, who have been waiting for this news. So talk timeline, right? What needs to happen to get shots in arms by the summer? You know, it's not just the parents, it's the doctors, it's the experts. Yeah. Everyone's been waiting for this for two years to get this final group immunized because we know the vaccine is the best protection we can get them, especially now that mandates are coming down, the requirements for masking is coming down, especially on public transportation. And a lot of parents I've talked to have said they're hesitant to take their two or three year old on an airplane or a train because they're worried they might catch it because they don't have that vaccine to protect them. And the reason it took so long is because one thing we have in medical school is that children are not just small adults. In other words, you can't just take the data you got from adults and say, well, let's just cut the size down and give it to children. That should work okay. We need to specifically dose it for children. And what they did here is pretty interesting. They divided these children into two age groups, six months to two-year-olds and then two-year-olds to five-year-olds, because any parent can tell you a two-year-old is a lot different than a four-year-old as far as body size and just even their immune systems are completely different. But they found out that, at least for the Moderna vaccine, that these age groups needed the same vaccine, like you mentioned, a quarter of the dosing. And so they went ahead and went with this. They found the effectiveness, 51% for the younger ones, that's the six month to two year olds, 37% for the older ones, the two year olds to the six year olds. And they said, that looks pretty good. It's comparable to what adolescents are getting against Omicron. Let's go ahead and push forward this and submit for the EUA, Hallie. There's been some polling out from earlier this year that found that only one in five parents with the littlest kids would actually go right away to get the vaccine once it gets approved, right? So when you say that efficacy number, Dr. John, let's say 37% percent for that two to five age group. What do you say to parents who are saying that doesn't seem like a very high efficacy rate enough to overcome my hesitation to get my kid the vaccine? How, how should we be thinking about that? And so I think there's a couple things they need to think about because they've probably heard about just here the efficacy rate, the effectiveness of that 51 and 37 percent thinking that's not all that much. Plus, on top of that, the CDC in New York just came out with information showing that three out of four children ended up having COVID at some point and have that natural immunity built up to a certain extent. But addressing that right away, that natural immunity, we don't know how protective that is. We don't know how long it's going to last. It depends on how sick they got, their immune system, how it reacted to it. So there's a lot of unknowns there, whereas if they get the vaccine, vaccine, it brings them up to a baseline, a very high baseline. And like I mentioned, that 51% or 37%, that is protecting them against illness. That's anything. Even a mild sniffle, a slight cough, feeling fatigued, any of those small things. But more importantly, it's much higher percentage at protecting them from serious illness, which also protects them from hospitalizations and death. With at the end of the day, that's what we want the vaccine to do. If our children or if us, if we get sick, but we recover and we're fine, the vaccine vaccine did its job, and we think this one will as well, and that's why Moderna is pushing this forward. Kit, we're showing a statistic on the screen that kids were five times more likely to be hospitalized during Omicron than during the previous Delta variant, right? But Dr. John, what do you say to those who might say kids are lower risk anyway, right? When you look at the numbers, fewer kids end up seriously sick than adults anyway. Why should they be convinced to get the vaccine? And, you know, I've been saying this for two years with children. Yes, we know that they don't catch it as often and they don't get as sick as often, but that doesn't mean they're not going to catch it. And that doesn't mean they're not going to get sick. You know, we've had a large number of children dying from COVID, unfortunately, around a thousand, which is, you know, a thousand more than any of us want. And so you never quite know with your child what's going to happen as far as them acutely getting sick. Plus, now we know about this long term COVID issue coming up. We don't know how that's going to affect yeah. children, especially a few years from now, a few decades from now when they're adults. So you want to make sure you protect them now, because this is a nasty virus that could cause some issues. That vaccine is still the best thing you can do for them. Big news. Dr. John Torres, thanks for uh, being with us tonight. Appreciate it. Turning now to news out of Washington, former NYPD officer and January 6th defendant Thomas Webster using the self-defense strategy on the stand today. He's this ex-cop charged with attacking another police officer with a flagpole outside the Capitol. Webster telling jurors that Metropolitan Police Officer Noah Rathburn taunted him and called his attack with the flagpole a schoolyard fight. And Webster said he put his hand on Rathburn's gas mask, like you see here, because he wanted him to see his hands and that that's what he was taught in officer training. He also testified he wore a bulletproof vest underneath his jacket that day. 
Rathburn seen in this video hitting Webster in the face after Webster shoved the metal barricade into him. The officer testifying yesterday, he didn't start it, right? And that he was the one struggling to get Webster off him. Joining me now is Ryan Riley. And Ryan, let, let's just say this. There are, this is now the fourth jury trial for a January 6th defendant, right? And so I think it, to, to a degree, for some folks, it might start to run together. This is a uniquely interesting trial because it is an ex-police officer charged with being at this riot, right, who is claiming self-defense, despite some of the video that we've been showing that shows him hitting another officer with a flagpole. Right. So it's officer on officer. So one of them clearly isn't telling the truth is what you have to basically boil this down to. You have a situation here where he's trying to justify this attack on an officer by saying he was being taunted at this moment. But if you look more broadly at that video, what you're going to see is this was a mob attack at one time. And it would be sort of ridiculous for an officer to have invited someone to individually fight him when they were so outnumbered that day. There was no way he could have gotten into a fight with this officer. And this, this narrative that he's shifting, I think you have to, if you step back for a moment, he realized this is a guy who spent 20 years on the New York City police force. He has experience testifying before juries, unlike the previous January 6th defendant who didn't have that same experience. So he's pretty confident on the stand and knows how to shape a narrative around existing evidence. When you say previous January 6th defendant, you're referring to the only other defendant who's taken the stand in his own defense. Webster is only the second one of these people to do that. And as you point out... He's been on, he potentially, as a cop, has been on the stand before. Were you actually, you were at the courtroom, right? I was, yes. Are you able to go in and actually see it in the room, or COVID protocols keep you out? Yeah, actually, you can go in now. Everyone's masked up. So how did it go? How did the jury seem to react to some of this? Because you look at these videos, like, the videos are telling some of the story here, right? So, so when Webster comes on the stand and claims self-defense, did it seem like they were buying that? You see some, like, confused looks. You mostly saw you a lot of nods with the prosecution when they were going along with their story. And, yeah, I, I mean, they're listening. But he, I mean, you know, he does make eye contact with the jurors. He's clearly done this before, right? He knows how to craft this narrative. He is a compelling witness. He's kind of a friendly guy. He comes off that way on the stand. I mean, he, you know, I think he would normally come off on the stand, but the story that he's telling is just kind of, frankly, ridiculous when you look at the evidence. She's charged with six counts? Yeah. And what's the likelihood, you know, we've seen January 6th defendants before him who have gone to jury trial, um, charged on, you know, ended up getting those charges against them. Yeah, well, you know, the last person who was convicted who testified uh, before uh, a jury was actually sent to jail immediately afterwards. As soon as he was convicted, the judge wanted to send a message there. So that's always a possibility here. But he has severe criminal exposure if he uh, ultimately is convicted in this case. When do we think the jury will come back with something? You know, it could be as soon as tomorrow, potentially, but more likely, I think at this point, maybe bleed into next week. Ryan Riley, thank you. Good to see you. Appreciate You're it. Well. Thanks. Just a couple hours ago, the FDA announced a plan to ban sales of menthol cigarettes. And listen, this is a pretty big deal. Here's why. The agency is saying this ban would make health better and reduce the death rate for people who smoke these kinds of cigarettes, most of whom are black in the U.S. After cigarette companies for decades targeted black Americans through their ads, through music festivals, through community events, those companies have denied doing that. But look at these numbers. Almost 85% of black smokers use menthols. That's almost three times more than white smokers. Black men also have the highest rates of lung cancer in the country, and they're dying at higher rates from the disease, too. For context, menthol is a chemical from mint that gives this kind of cooling sensation, and it apparently makes it a little harder to quit. It makes the cigarette feel, taste a little more smooth. Dr. Kavita Patel is joining us now on this. So, um, Dr. Patel, public health advocates for years have been wanting this kind of ban. Talk about the significance of the FDA moving on this now. This is huge, Hallie. When I worked on the Hill, I was working on some of the Tobacco Control Act. 2009, we were able to pass it, but that still was not enough to get the ban on menthol cigarettes done, to your point, because there was such a strong lobby, so much kind of misinformation around the detrimental effects. As you pointed out, a disproportionate amount of black smokers, something that people don't realize, 60% of pregnant women smoke menthols. And as you point out, that mint kind of cooling sensation actually makes it seem less like smoke, and it makes it easier for kids to start smoking. So this starts young. Huge deal. 2019, about 19 million menthol smokers. Imagine the disease we can prevent by eliminating that option. Is it possible that there could be another fierce lobbying effort? We know that tobacco oh, industry yeah. is, is obviously against us. This. this is controversial. Could it Right. Could this get derailed before it goes into effect? So this is a 60-day proposed rule, and that's good. The FDA took a step to make sure that they get public comment and feedback and any criticisms. 
there is likely to be a legal challenge or maybe legal challenges to this. But Hallie, the science is so compelling. It was compelling 13 years ago, and it's compelling in 2022. And with NAACP, CDC, so many health authorities and advocacy groups that are out there, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, another one, this is just going to be hard to kind of overcome from a legal challenge, meaning legal challenges just do not have merit when you think about the science behind it. And especially when you think about the health uh, health equity disparities, right, right? When, it, when it cuts exactly. across demographics, no? Right, right. That and children. I can't, yeah. okay. I, I mean, think about this way. Children, infants, and pregnant women, it's really hard to dispute the facts there and how this really has been something that we have kind of knowledge-based. We knew that this was a problem. Now we're finally able to take the regulatory steps to do it. Long time coming, but better late than never. Dr. Kavita Patel, as you say, um, you, you know this issue. You've been working on it for years. I appreciate you joining us on the show tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So did you hear about this? Florida Governor Ron DeSantis flying 1,800 miles, not to Florida, not to anywhere on the East Coast, but to help a friend running for Senate and maybe, just maybe, to test the waters for a potential 2024 presidential run. Yet Governor DeSantis overnight campaigning for his friend and former roommate Adam Laxalt, who's running in Nevada. The former state attorney general is trying to turn the heat up on his campaign. And Governor DeSantis looked to be helping with that. He wanted to. More than 1,000 people showing up to watch this campaign rally. Guad Venegas is on the campaign trail in Nevada and is joining us now. And Guad, Nevada is one of those states with an early voting contest. Did the governor sound like a presidential candidate to you? Because that's what the speculation is here, right, that he showed up for 2022, but he's got his eye on 24. Ali, well, he sounded like someone who has a lot of support from Republicans in Nevada. Uh, we were told this is the largest event that Adam Laxalt has had. And, of course, Adam Laxalt taking advantage of that friendship that you mentioned. Uh, they both said they've been friends since before they were even in politics. And, of course, for Ron DeSantis, it's an opportunity to leave the state and come to a place like Nevada, a state that was won by President Biden in the 2020 election, but that is still considered a swing state. So, like you said, he's testing the waters seen what people are like outside of his state. And, you know, he went on stage and started talking about all of the things he's done in Florida that uh, are against what Democrats have done, talking about the mask mandates around the country that he did not accept, talking about the stance he's taken against Disney. And people here uh, were cheering, and they were very happy to see uh, Ron DeSantis. Let's take a listen to some of what he said when he was on stage last night. I bring greetings from... The Sunshine State, the Freedom State, and the state that has done more than any other state to stand up to Joe Biden and his floundering administration. Now, Ron DeSantis coming to Nevada is also supercharging Adam Laxalt, who's looking to win the Republican primary and ultimately face uh, incumbent Senator Catherine Cortez Masto, the Democrat here, who's looking to be reelected. So this was definitely positive for both uh, Laxalt and DeSantis for whatever plans they have in the coming future. Guad Venegas, I have to say, I'm, I'm struck by the guy you met that had printed up 2,000 DeSantis 2024 hats, who's got a lot at stake now financially, hoping that DeSantis does, in fact, throw his hat in the ring for the presidential. Guad, thank you so much. Good to see you in Vegas. Coming up here on the show, new reaction tonight from the husband of the cinematographer who was shot and killed on the movie set of Rust. What he's saying about the video that we're not going to show that shows his wife's final moments. And sportscaster Sage Steele, She's suing ESPN, saying she was sidelined after some controversial vaccine remarks. The free speech fight that's brewing there, next. The husband of the cinematographer who was shot and killed on the set of Rust is slamming the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office for releasing video of her final moments. Not too long ago, the sheriff's department released all their evidence in the case so far. This was a few days ago, including body cam footage of paramedics trying to save Helena Hutchins' life. NBC News is not going to show that video. But an attorney from Matthew Hutchins is now demanding the office take down the video, saying they didn't give Hutchins dignity and privacy. The sheriff's office has yet to respond to the letter, but earlier this week, the county sheriff said that while they didn't have a timeline for releasing evidence, they felt like they had to do it. Watch. 
I think the main point is that it was a public records request that we were, we are required to release the information, but it was also uh, uh, an attempt to be transparent in the investigation. Maggie Vespa is joining us now with the latest. So Maggie, you know, Hutchins attorney says her husband saw the video um, and isn't just worried about the loss of dignity for her, but the effect on their kid. They have a nine-year-old son, right? Yeah, they do. And in a word, they say that he's basically worried about bullies, as they put it in the letter, essentially internet trolls, people who will for now, for years to come, be able to lack of a better word, mess with the couple's son, Andros. Again, he's nine years old right now, by at any minute sending him really graphic video of his mom dying. So they want that video taken down, the original link to that video by the sheriff's office. But they also note in their letter, you know, we're talking about the Internet. This is, in most cases like this, impossible to unring right. a bell like that. The video is out there. It's been copied to countless sites, and the family is furious. And they say in their letter, the damage is, their word, irreparable. We're also seeing some video of the moment that Baldwin found out about Helena Hutchins' death. Um, he's at the, sh right. the sheriff's office in the hours right after the shooting. I think we have a little bit of that to play. I do have some very unfortunate news to tell you. Um, she didn't make it. Matthew Hutchins is suing Baldwin, suing other Rust filmmakers over his wife's death. Mm -hmm. I think we have heard from Baldwin's attorney since all of this evidence has come out, right? We have, yeah. Baldwin's attorney sent us a statement actually just hours after this mountain of evidence was released. And here's part of that statement now. It reads, Mr. Baldwin welcomes this investigation. The information that has been revealed by the authorities demonstrates once again that Mr. Baldwin acted responsibly, again, in this statement, and did not have control over any production issues that were identified in the OSHA report. And that report they're referring to is a state workplace safety investigation that cited and then issued a $100,000 fine to Russ management for what they called willful serious safety violations tied to how firearms were handled on set. When it comes to this investigation, Maggie, I think this is the question a lot of people have. When are we going to know more? Right? It's been more than yeah. six months now. We know these things take time, but like, what is the timeline here? Exactly. And we know how much evidence they have, right? Yeah. They just released a ton of it. No hard timeline at this moment, according to the sheriff. He noted they're still waiting on a few key pieces of evidence, including forensics, on bullets and firearms they collected from the scene. Obviously, that's key. And they just want to answer that key question. How in the world did a live round get into a prop gun? And who, if anyone, should be held criminally responsible? Howie. Maggie Vespa, thank you for being on the show. Glad to have you. Appreciate it. ESPN Today is pushing back on some of these allegations from one of its sportscasters, Sage Steele. She's suing the company over allegations she was sidelined for some things that she said on a podcast. Steele says ESPN violated her right to free speech. This is part of a bigger issue we're seeing play out in a lot of places about what you can and can't say in the media, depending on who you are and maybe what your political views are. So what are the comments that sparked all this? It happened last September when Steele went on a podcast, she says on her day off, right, in her personal capacity, and criticized ESPN's COVID vaccine mandate. She called it sick. And she was accused of questioning former President Obama's racial identity, too. She got some blowback for that. And in response, according to Steele's suit, ESPN and its owner, Disney, forced her to publicly apologize, she says. And she says suspended her back in October. ESPN says we didn't suspend her. Zinkley Esmos following this story for us. Um, and Zinkley, talk about how we how we got here, right? Because there's a little bit of a of a discrepancy. I mean, there is. It's a he said, she said. She says she was suspended and sidelined. ESPN says, hey, we still put you on the Masters. You're still doing Sports Center. That's not sidelining. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. So let's go back in time. It really began September 2021. Steele was on that podcast you mentioned where she made what turned out to be pretty controversial remarks. First, about COVID and vaccine mandates enforced by ESPN, the company requiring all employees to be fully vaccinated against COVID at the time. In addition, she called it sick, as you mentioned, and also said getting vaccinated left her feeling defeated. But it did not end there when the host of the podcast, who's a former NFL quarterback, Jay Cutler, asked her about criticism she's faced in her own career. She mentioned that she's been called out for being biracial, and then she called out President Obama for how he identifies. So let's take a listen. Barack Obama chose black and he's biracial. I'm like, well, congratulations to the president. That's his thing. I, I think that's fascinating consider, considering his black dad was nowhere to be found, but his white mom and grandma raised him. But hey, mm -hmm. you do you. 
And Hallie, the conversation went further when Steele was asked about issues women face in the sports industry and locker room talk. She said women need to take responsibility. She said you know what you're doing when you're putting that outfit on, referring to maybe promiscu promiscuous outfits, adding that she doesn't believe anybody deserves anything. Okay, though. so let's get up to speed of this lawsuit because the lawsuit says Connecticut, ESPN violated this law in Connecticut and her right to free speech, basically. Connecticut has some pretty strong, strong free speech laws. I know you've been talking with legal experts about the likely outcome here. What are you hearing? Yeah, so free speech is so interesting and so nuanced. And I spoke with a First Amendment specialist at the Freedom Forum, Kevin Goldberg, and he says that if this case proceeds in Connecticut, Steele has a pretty good chance. Why? Well, Goldberg says that when an individual works for a private company, that private company can make employment-based decisions based on what you say, right? But Connecticut law is unique because it has provisions that prohibit employers from actually limiting free speech so we'll have to see where and how this case plays out, Hallie. But it's important to note that ESPN does continue to firmly deny all the allegations. Can we pull back and talk about the bigger implications here? Because free speech is something we've been talking about a lot lately in the media, particularly when it comes to conservative voices. I think about the news we just heard about Elon Musk getting ready to buy Twitter as he's you know, framing himself as this big defender of free speech. Um, you have this added element here of what your boss can and can't stop you from saying outside of work. There, this is a this is a microcosm of a bigger picture story. Absolutely. That's really what this is about. I think if we look small scale, just this case, Steele's team says that she is standing up to corporate America, right? But big picture, we're living at a time where basically everybody has their own soapbox, i.e. social media, and employers are trying to rein in what people are saying in their personal time to protect their public brands. But depending on how this plays out, if Steele wins her case, experts tell me that this could set a precedent for employees pushing back on speech restrictions and guidelines from their employers. Hallie. Zinkle, Estima. Zinkle, good to have you on with us. Thank you so much. We'll look for more of your reporting on Top Story with Tom Yamas tonight at 7 o'clock Eastern here on NBC News Now. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, 16 states are suing the post office over its purchase of 148,000 delivery trucks, delivery trucks that use gas. The lawsuit says the Postal Service underestimated the environmental impact of those trucks. Activist groups say they emit almost as much carbon dioxide as the ones the service uses now. Number two, LA police say they found multiple guns at ASAP Rocky's home after his recent arrest. The rapper is out of jail on bond after allegedly shooting somebody last November. Authorities say the guns will be tested to determine whether they belong to him and if they're connected to the shooting. Number three, a new study shows climate change may put you more at risk for new infectious diseases by 2070. The study was published in the journal Nature, and it found that migration could increase diseases jumping from animals to humans, especially in places like Africa and Asia. But researchers say not all viruses are going to spread to humans. Not everything is going to become a pandemic like COVID. Number four, Canada is removing a ban on blood donations from gay men. The old rule prevented donations from men who had sex within three months of giving blood. That's a rule that's considered homophobic by a lot of people. Canadian health officials say lifting the ban will allow for a more inclusive blood system donation. Number five, a single lottery ticket in Arizona won the Powerball $437.1 million. It's that point one that really makes a difference. Whoever got it, got it at this convenience store in Gilbert. We don't know who the winner is yet, but you can take your lump sum of $283 million. If it's you, if you live in Arizona, you went to that quick trip, check your ticket, man. Still to come. College decision day is almost here, and we might be seeing a lot fewer students actually going to school this fall. We're going to explain in tonight's original. Plus, will President Biden make good on his campaign pledge to reduce the amount of student loan debt we all have? How far is he going to go? We'll talk about it next. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. And tonight it's college enrollment. High school seniors only have a few days left before that May 1st deadline to decide on where they're going to go to school. But a growing number of students are putting off college altogether. Listen to this. In the 2020-2021 school year, 130,000 students took a gap year compared to 40 to 60,000 students before the pandemic, according to the Gap Year Association. That's a big difference. Data shows we're seeing the biggest decline in college enrollments in nearly half a century, nearly 50 years. 
Some experts warn that this might affect our economy negatively down the road. But for a lot of students today, new job opportunities mean you can make some money faster, sooner. Here's Rahima Ellis with more. Learning during the pandemic was Brianne Steinman's toughest test. The first year, it was chaotic. But despite the stress, she got mostly A's and was accepted to Indiana University of Pennsylvania. I'm very excited, I am, to go to college. But not right away, and she's not alone. Research shows a dramatic decline of nearly one million students in colleges nationwide, almost double the number in 2019 before the start of the pandemic. Community colleges hit the hardest, with a 13% drop-off from pre-pandemic enrollment levels. That's very concerning. Concerning, researchers say, because it's the most affordable college opportunity for many students and a way out of poverty. They also point out the decline is more widespread than ever before. And now it's across the board, two-year and four-year colleges. That's right. This is suggesting that it's not just about the pandemic anymore. It starts to look more and more like students are really questioning the value of going to college at all, rather than just whether this is a good time to go to college. One reason wages are going up even without a college degree. Walmart's now offering its first year truck drivers $95 to $110,000 a year, up from $87,000. What we're seeing in the data today is that more and more students are choosing what may be short-term gains. In addition, he's concerned that declining enrollment in science-based classes could have dire consequences overall. If we don't rapidly reverse these rates of change in majors that are in high demand even today, like computer science and engineering, I don't think we have a very bright future in terms of our ability to maintain a high-tech economy in the future. But Brianne, a member of the Arapaho and Shoshone tribe, says her future includes earning money during a gap year to help pay for nursing school. I'm so dedicated to going to college because you need degrees to work like in the medical field. One student staying on course to make her dream come true. Rahema Ellis is joining us now. Rahema, I'm so glad you're here with us because when you look at the numbers here, a decline, like going down about a million students, it sounds like a lot. What are college administrators telling you? How are they dealing with this kind of thing? Well, one of the things I've realized, Hallie, is it is a lot. And what they're doing is they're trying to target their programs and services more to all of those students because they need all of them for colleges to survive, not so much the private colleges, but those public ones, and particularly the community colleges and even some black colleges, if you will. So it's not just academic services. It's emotional services. It's social services, as well as, of course, the health services that they're trying to make certain that they provide for students because they know that these two and a half years of going through a pandemic has been horrible on so many kids. And in addition to that, they're thinking about, do they want to take on that burden as well as the financial burden of going to school? It's one of the reasons a lot of people are keeping their eye on something you mentioned earlier in your program, and that is about the Biden administration's effort to try and reduce the impact of student right. loan debts on kids. So if they're making a lot of money now, if they can make it, they're foregoing going to college. But the experts will tell you, Hallie, going to college means over a lifetime of a career. A college student has the potential to make upwards of a million dollars more over their lifetime of working versus someone who does not go to college. Rahema Ellis. Rahema, it's great reporting, and we're glad that you're with us tonight to share it. Thank you. Rahema teed us up really well for this next discussion. She was talking about the student loan debt thing, right? President Biden's talking about it. He's saying he's just weeks away from deciding whether he's going to take steps towards a big campaign promise, which is reducing student debt. Just a few days after a private meeting at the White House with House Democrats, where a couple of sources tell our team that the president was asked to extend the moratorium on federal loan payments, meaning keep that pause button smashed as far as when you have to repay your loans. And, and this is really important, cancel altogether $10,000 of debt per borrower, his 2020 pledge. And that could go a long way, because students who graduated in 2019, for example, have an average of $29,000 in loan debt. Republicans are pretty opposed to this idea. They worry it would add to the national debt. More than 45 million people altogether owe a trillion 
I'm sorry, they owe $1.7 trillion in loan debt. That's a lot of money. That is a record amount. And it's about one in every six people. So if you know 10 people, one of them, chances are, if not two, are going to owe money. Joining me now is Sahil Kapoor. Um, Sahil, talk through the specifics here. Timeline on a potential forgiveness plan and what it would look like. First on the timeline, Hallie, President Biden said it would be a couple weeks. He didn't elaborate beyond that. And specifically what this policy would look like, it would be the use of President Biden's executive power under the Higher Education Act of, of 1965, which many experts and uh, Democratic allies of the president and Congress say he has the authority to use as the basis for forgiving up to $50,000 in student debt. Now, Biden made clear that he's not going to go that high. He didn't give a dollar amount. He didn't get more specific, but that's what it would look like. It would be an administrative decision uh, that he can do through the Department of Education to forgive a significant amount of student debt for millions of young people out there with federal loans. Republicans have already said they're not down for this. They don't want to see this kind of thing. So uh, does the president work across the aisle? Does he do this by executive order? It seems like it's the latter, no? That's exactly right. There's no hope for working across the aisle to get uh, legislative action through. He can get something through the House of Representatives, although even there, um, there is some dispute within the Democratic Party as to how aggressively the party should lean in on uh, this issue. But there's no hope of uh, passing anything like that through the Senate, where, of course, there's a 60-vote threshold for most legislation. Uh, that means getting at least 10 Republicans, and Republicans have made clear they don't have any interest in this issue, apart from the fact that they argue it would add to the national debt. Democrats Demographically, the Republican Party, you know, their voters are increasingly older, they're increasingly uh, non-college educated, so the demographic incentives don't really align for them, whereas for the Democratic Party, they absolutely do. The Democratic Party uh, relies heavily on younger voters, and right. their base is becoming more and more college educated. And there is a political component to this, too, because if you look at the president's approval ratings, they are down among that demographic, among younger voters, um, just a few months here, six months before the midterms. Absolutely, Ali, and that is unmistakable context here, because President Biden has not, in the eyes of young voters, done a particularly good job at fulfilling his campaign promises and delivering on issues that matter to them. I recently spoke to a bunch of uh, young voters, I should say voters under 35, depends on uh, your definition. That's young. But Sahil, that I is young. Fair enough. <laughs> Young voters uh, <laughs> under 35. And the single biggest concern that uh, just about all of them cited to me was uh, the cost of living, their ability to yeah. afford uh, life these days and their economic futures. They worry millennials and Gen Z uh, have good reason to believe they'll be the first two generations in the country's history to be worse off financially than their parents. And student debt would be a very tangible way to relieve a, a, a major element of financial stress off those voters. And and it's something yeah. that uh, there's a, a tangible, ar a real argument that the president could do by himself. So that, I think that's why Biden has landed in this position where he's seriously considering this. Ali. Sahil Kapoor, thank you very much for that reporting. Still ahead, another celebrity controversy after Olivia Wilde was served custody papers literally while on stage. We've got more on that fallout next. Plus, earlier this month, people in D.C. were worried about a fox. Now it's a wild turkey on the loose. Can't wait for the local in just a minute. The NFL draft is kicking off tonight, and nobody really knows how the first round is going to play out. We're talking about top picks and those surprises in just a bit. But first, NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our West Coast Bureau, the San Diego Police Department is investigating this. Look at this, what some people call a rough arrest. After this video... You see that? Went viral on TikTok. It shows an officer throwing a woman to the ground and then punching her twice. No word on what happened before the arrest. The department says it understands the community's concern but doesn't want people to jump to conclusions just yet. We're going to keep our eye on that one. From our Northeast Bureau, officials in New Jersey are investigating something weird, some sort of substance. They don't know what. that's leaking into a large lake. Look, it's turning it kind of white here. Health officials say they don't know why this is happening, but they say testing shows it's not harmful to people. It's not affecting the drinking water either. And from our D.C. Bureau, an angry bird on the loose in this town. Check it out. Somebody captured this video of a wild turkey chasing him, attacking or going after another woman on the trail. Officials plan to capture the bird and then have a vet evaluate it before they release it to a nearby wildlife sanctuary. A lot of people think there's a lot of turkeys in Washington, but most of them inside the Capitol. I'm not, I'm not saying that. Some people say that. 
a lot of buzz surrounding a really uncomfortable onstage moment with a celebrity. And we're not talking about the Oscars. We're talking about Olivia Wilde getting served with custody papers from her ex, Jason Sudeikis, while on stage at CinemaCon in Las Vegas. Sources for Sudeikis confirm, yes, inside the envelope you just saw, those were custody papers for the two kids the former couple share. As for the timing of why it was delivered like this in such a public way, Sudeikis apparently didn't know and said he'd never want the papers served in such a, quote, inappropriate manner. Look at these pictures. Wilde was right in the middle of introducing her latest film in front of thousands of people when somebody, I guess, came on stage, handed her a manila envelope marked personal and confidential. She's looking at it. She thinks it's a script at first. She sees what ins what's inside. She says thank you. She goes along with her speech. It wasn't until afterward, when everyone was buzzing about what was in it, that this all came out. Danny Savalos is here to get into this. And Danny, Sudeikis' rep is saying, okay, he had no prior knowledge it would happen like this. When somebody is serving papers to somebody else, how much control do they or their reps have over how the delivery of those documents happen? I tend to think it's probably true that Sudeikis was not aware of how she was going to be served because I serve people all the time, every day. I use a process server. The client isn't involved at all in that decision. And uh, even in a high-profile case like this, uh, I don't think Sudeikis would have even directed, unless he was particularly diabolical, uh, directed service in this manner. But I have to say something, Allie. In terms of getting what we call good service, Diabolical as this may have been, it was good service because no one will ever doubt later on or question that she absolutely received these papers in front of, what, 100 or so witnesses? Right. So uh, as inappropriate as it may have been, uh, somewhere probably at the process server's office, they're saying ah, that was a pretty good job because it was definitely proper service. Well, you know where they're not saying that is at CinemaCon because of security concerns, too, right? The fact that this person was able to get this packet to Olivia Wilde on stage, they're reevaluating, they say, their security procedures. Is that a layer of this here, too? Not for service and process purposes. She is served. It's over. Uh, the process server has done his or her job. But in terms of security, look, this has been an issue since Chris Rock got slapped by Will Smith. And now you see this happening relatively soon after. Security in these events, I mean, folks that are as high profile as Chris Rock and Olivia Wilde, I mean, there are folks that are going to want to get to them. And I'm surprised that uh, now that everyone's on notice after the Will Smith, Chris Rock incident, that a regular person not named Will Smith is able to get on stage and access an A-list celebrity. Danny Savalos, thank you very much for that perspective. After the break, we're hours away from this year's NFL draft. It's coming up tonight. And there's a lot of questions about who's going to be the first pick. Prospects, predictions, even for the non-sports lovers among you, when we come back with Sam Brock. What happens in Vegas is anyone's guess right now when it comes to the NFL draft. Kicks off tonight, and you can expect some surprises because for the first time in five years, a quarterback is not expected to be the first-round pick. We haven't seen that in a while. The Jags, the Jacksonville Jaguars, they're getting the top choice for the second year in a row. Last year, they got QB Trevor Lawrence, so now maybe they're looking to build up some other areas of the team. Sam Brock is joining us now to talk about it. So, Sam, even if you're not into sports, right, we all know the big-name quarterbacks. Andrew Luck, Cam Newton, Matthew Stafford, they were all first-round picks. So why this year are we not seeing a QB go? Is it, like, and I don't mean this in a, in a offensive, is it a lack of talent in the QB ranks? Yes. Or is it because of the team picking? No, it's talent, for sure. And if you look historically, Hallie, at the last 15 drafts, 11 of them were quarterbacks. You mentioned Trevor Lawrence last year, Joe Burrow, who just got to a Super Bowl the year before that. But this year, I am told that of the high-level draft evaluators, they say about six of the quarterbacks from last year's draft would all go ahead of anyone from this year's. One guy to keep an eye on, though, is Malik Willis. He started out at the University of Auburn, ended up transferring to Liberty, played for a small school there, and tore it up. He's a dynamic playmaker. You have very powerhouse traditional franchises like the Pittsburgh Steelers, for example, just signed Mitch Trubisky as a, as a bridge quarterback. They might take Malik Willis, take a shot at him with the Seattle Seahawks. They just traded Russell Wilson. There are teams with need, but it is entirely possible, Hallie, we could get through the entire first round in Las Vegas without a quarterback being selected. Who else should we be looking out for? Who else has good stories? It's a great question. So there's a bevy of, of talented wide receivers. There's disruptive edge rushers, but you don't want to hear about that. I, you want to hear about the backstories of interesting people. <laughs> disruptive so edge that, rushers? Okay? What show are you on, Sam? <laughs> I mean, I don't even I know. I know my audience. <laughs> Seriously. All right. Well, let me tell you something right now. This is a great story about Trey McBride. This is a tight end, went to Colorado State. 
He grew up in Colorado in a small town in the 1990s. He was part of a family there, five kids. He has two moms, so same-sex parents. Once he is drafted into the NFL, he will become the first NFL player with same-sex parents. Why is this notable? Well, for one reason, Carl Nassib just came out as the first actively gay player in the NFL within the last year or so. I'm in the state of Florida where we're seeing bigoted legislation over don't say gay and not allowing kids to understand non-nuclear families. At this point in time, the NFL is seeing this and, and doubling down. They have the National Gay Flag Football League is one of the honorary groups presenting a pick at the draft. So this is history right there. You also have someone like Devin Lloyd, who is an all-American linebacker for the University of Utah, got Utah to its first ever Pac-12 title. This is after he lost not one one but two teammates to gun violence in the last couple of years. It is so important for their program that this group could have canceled their season and instead came together. He's probably going to get picked in the first round That's of tonight's amazing. draft as well. Yeah. That has to make you feel good. There's just so many inspiring stories. Yeah. That is the best part, Hallie, so of the NFL draft. For people who are watching, I don't know where, Sam, wherever you are, are you at, you're in Miami, are you at our Telemundo Bureau or are you in a Miami Bureau? I'm at a club right now. No, I'm at Telemundo. Okay, cool. Uh, and they're having their yeah. annual party, welcome back party. We Got just it. moved into this building as well. So there's literally a band playing directly below me, if that's I what was you're just, hearing right my now. My only point was, always that, a party. It was that you're not in Vegas, which is kind of sad because it's going to be a major production for the draft this year. Like, I'm sad for you that you're not in Vegas right now, although Telemundo can throw a, can throw a bash, I'm sure. It's pretty close. It is pretty close. I wish I were in Vegas. I checked the Cosmopolitan right now, under $300 for tonight, which I got to tell you, has been a lot worse than that. I would love to be in Las Vegas. By the way, at the Bellagio, they have a floating stage. That's where the red carpet is that you're looking at right there, right over those historic founds. It's a super cool setup. I guess I'll have to hear about it through uh, some friends and, and relatives who might be able to check it out. All right, let's get the CFO of Comcast NBCU to get you that $300 night room, okay? We'll get you exactly. out there. Sam Brock, Why we're not? here for you. We advocate for our correspondence, Sam. Thank you. Appreciate You'll seeing you. will my table any day. That's Thanks, it for us for this hour. I am off tomorrow, but Joe Fryer will have more for you right here. Same time, same place. I'll see you next week. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.